In 2013, Human Rights Watch interviewed 141 children who were working on tobacco farms in the United States. They were between the ages of 7 and 17 and were a small sampling of the unknown number of child agriculture workers in the U.S., which is estimated in the hundreds of thousands. The report that Human Rights Watch released the next year was based on these interviews and also included extensive research detailing the illnesses, injuries, and injustices that these children faced. It was well covered by the press and had large tobacco companies scrambling to reassure the public that they were going to do everything they could to protect children on American farms. Well, that was back in 2014, and I thought it was time for a progress report. So I called up my friend Oscar Colazos, a Colombian-born stand-up comedian here in New York, hired him to be my translator, and we headed down south to try to take Where I Don't Belong undercover for the first time. Callahan and I'm here in North Carolina to find out what it's really like to work in a tobacco field. A large majority of the tobacco produced in the U.S. comes from farms in North Carolina, so that's where we headed. We landed in Raleigh and drove straight out to Goldsboro, a small town smack dab in the middle of tobacco country. The first person you want to talk to when you want to know anything about farm labor in North Carolina is this guy. My name is Justin Flores, Vice President of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, known as FLOC, or Farm Workers Union. The need for, for a labor union, um, I think, is made clear by the fact that this industry has not advanced as other industries have, and agriculture workers are excluded from the Labor Relations Act. So there's no law that covers them, guarantees the right to negotiate, guarantees the right to, to join a union. Uh, and it shows. I mean, you still have some of the lowest pay, some of the worst conditions, and that's pretty obvious uh, that some audits here and there and some little cosmetic fixes are not going to change the real problems going on out here. Justin told us that all we had to do to get hired on a tobacco picking crew was drive around looking for posters advertising farm labor, call the number, and tell them there were two of us looking to work. The posters were easy to find, and within a few hours, we were hired onto a crew for the next day. We knew we were going to have to come up with a not suspicious explanation for why two people of our age and clear lack of experience and clear out-of-towner vibes suddenly wanted to show up and work in tobacco for a day. So we lied. We basically just went around to all any Spanish speaking businesses we could find yesterday and found a whole bunch of phone numbers just on pieces of paper just put in the window and called around and told everybody we were students at the University of Florida, agriculture students, and that we wanted to work in the fields for a day. Probably what we're going to be doing is topping and suckering, which is where you pull the flowers off the top of the tobacco plant and um, you pull the little shoots that will eventually become flowers uh, to make sure all the plant's energies go toward uh, growing the leaves. Um, but there was a giant thunderstorm last night, so what we might be doing uh, is taking the plants because sometimes the rain and the wind will push the plants over and eventually if they stay that way obviously they'll die so it's really important to like put them back upright so we might just be like totally soaked by the end of the day time to go we got to a small bodega on the side of a small road just as the sun was beginning to rise and waited for about 30 minutes before a van rolled into the parking lot. The crew leader informed us that there was no room for us in the van and told us to follow him in our own car to the fields. 
We agreed, since neither of us were excited to be stuck in the middle of nowhere without transportation for the next 12 to 14 hours. We drove around the countryside for about an hour, gathering more vehicles into our caravan until we finally pulled into the field at about 7 a.m. with a crew of 12 people. As I looked around, I remembered my conversation with Cynthia, an activist with Flock, who told me all about her experiences in the fields. I was about 14, first time I worked in tobacco. I got tobacco sickness, which is the worst thing, and I could not do it no more. I was throwing up, went home all night throwing up. My mom gave me a gallon of milk and she told me to drink it, <laughs> a gallon of milk. But it really did help. The headache I had, it was unbelievable. Just the heat that you feel in your body when you're throwing up all day. The contractor, he laughed. He was like, oh, no aguantas. So, you know, that was, that was the last time that I did it. And then I moved on into the packing sheds, which was a lot less work than in the fields, but it's still hard work. Having to work from 7 to 12 with no break, one hour of lunch, and then you go from 12 until 9 o'clock sometimes. No break. This is our crew. The asterisks mark the members of the group who are under the age of 18. I didn't ask for a government issue photo ID, but when a person is four feet tall and looks like they're in seventh grade, I'm going to believe him when he tells me he's 12, like this boy did. At just about 7 a.m. on the dot, we got to work. Wearing ponchos, long sleeve shirts, and gloves, we started topping and suckering the tobacco plants. Within 30 minutes, my partner Oscar and I were soaked from head to toe, despite the ponchos. As we got into the rhythm of the work, we started to have time to look around us. There were definitely no porta potties, drinking water, or hand washing facilities on this field. There was a small trailer like residence on the edge of the field, but three very large and very loud dogs constantly patrolled the edge of the field and made it known that we were not welcome. The lack of facilities made me a little nervous because as a female who was smack dab in the middle of my menstrual cycle and carrying one solitary tampon wrapped in a Ziploc bag in my left boot, a bathroom break at some point in the day was not going to be optional. I was able to put that out of my mind for most of the morning as Oscar and I started talking to the other crew members. Oscar is a native Spanish speaker and is exceptionally good at connecting with people. So I mostly listened as he effortlessly got complete strangers to open up about their 12 to 14 hour work days, about their experiences working with different crops, about their sons and daughters who spoke perfect English, did great in school, and were getting their learner's permits. We saw pictures of this woman's newborn baby. She was back in the fields and working 20 days after giving birth to her third child. When Oscar asked who was watching the baby, she said some lady and explained that childcare arrangements were pretty informal because no one could afford regular daycare. If my mom would have got paid more, I would have never had to go work in the fields. But honestly, think about it. Babysitters charge $10 an hour to take care of a kid when your mom is getting paid $7.25. So I decided I'd, I'd rather go and work for $7.25 than just, you know, get my mom out there working and having to pay everything for a babysitter. Some of the younger workers spoke English. This 14-year-old girl told me that she gets straight A's in school and wants to be a doctor or a nurse. She's working over the summer to help her mom pay the bills. She wasn't able to find any other work. On this particular day, she was here with her grandmother, a woman who appeared to be in her 60s or 70s, who liked to sing while she worked. I asked the 12-year-old boy where his parents were, and he shrugged, saying that they were working in a different field that day, so he didn't know. You know, when you have people out in the field that are 12, 13, and 14, uh, they're not out there because, you know, they need, you know, really like working outside or because they need new sneakers or because, you know, any other reason except for that their families need that money to eat, to pay rent, and to have clothes. 
Uh, and so the child labor issue is really tied up with the, with the low wage and all the other exploitation going on. We got a few small five-minute rests here and there when we reached the ends of these seemingly infinite rows. But even so, lunch couldn't come soon enough. It was at our one-hour lunch break that we got our first and last access to a restroom when the caravan loaded up and drove the seven or so minutes to a nearby town. After lunch is when the day got brutal. The sun came out full force. We had finished the first field and thought that we might be done for the day, only to discover another field just beyond the trees bigger than the first. But that wasn't nearly the biggest obstacle that Oscar and I would face.